Guys, welcome to The Disruptors, the show where we get the folks most focused on the future and the ones creating it. Today, we've got Mark Sackler on the program, an epic futurist with a big vision. Thanks for coming today, Mark. Hey, my pleasure and uh, great to be here, Matt. It, so we were talking before the program and you had something that really caught my interest. The golf course wasn't good enough for me. You're 66 now. What's your story, Mark, and what brings you here? Well, actually, I'm 68. Oh, and congratulations. <laughs> it's still kicking. Well, first of all, I've been interested in the longevity extension movement probably since the 1970s, before even Aubrey de Grey and company knew what it was, although I really didn't know much about the science until recently. I read a book called Here Comes Immortality by Jerome, Jerome to Chile. It's a bit of a firebrand um, libertarian, uh, and it was very much scenarios of, of, a, a, of a longer lived future, although the, the science wasn't anything like what we have today. But I've kind of been lurking on the fringes of the futurist community the last 20 years. And when I sold my share of my business to my three younger partners four years ago, I said, I can't retire to the golf course. It's just I need meaning in my life. And I actually decided at that point to kind of recycle some of my, my past experience in broadcasting. I was a newscaster and sportscaster locally in Connecticut back in the 1970s. And to put that toward, toward foresight, so I took a, a graduate certificate in foresight from the University of Houston and then embarked on, on podcasting and blogging in order to kind of be an advocate for better better futures for a better tomorrow. But also, um, uh, one of the things I do adv advocate for is, is longevity extension. And I know a lot of people have their, their doubts about that. We can get into, into that if you, if you want. But I think that the best story about, about that and, and why I think it's the right thing to do um, was a conversation that I had with one of my coworkers in one of my, uh, the last company I worked for before I went out on my own, a pharmaceutical uh, industry, a company that uh, uh, did uh, assays for pharma pharmaceutical companies. And uh, I, my job was actually to sell analytical instruments that we had. And I was having an argument with uh, one of my coworkers who said that, uh, you know, he was opposed to this whole idea of longevity extension because the earth doesn't have the resources, we'll become overpopulated, uh, we need youth. And I, I just looked him in the eye and said, then why are you wasting your time in the pharmaceutical industry? And he was like, huh? And I'm like, 80% of what we do is combat the diseases of aging, but we're combating the symptoms after they occur. The cause, for the most part, is aging it itself, whether be it Alzheimer's, cancer, heart disease, these cre increase exponentially with age. And the cause, the deepest underlying cause is aging itself. So, you know, can't have it both ways. Didn't really have an answer for that. But, but at any rate, for me, I'm looking forward to continue to be productivity. I feel like, you know, if I don't keep moving, I'm going to die. And it's true. If we don't keep moving, if we don't stay active, we do die, which I find very interesting. I'm, I'm fascinated by what you did. I think it's incredibly brilliant. I've heard of universities that are bringing retired folks in there to study and live with the students, and it drastically increases longevity. What brought you to the the health sphere initially, the longevity space, all those 20 years ago before Aubrey had his big beard? Well, it, you know, I said in terms of the longevity, I've sort of been aware of it, the, the, the notion that people were thinking about it going back to the 70s. But just in terms of foresight and thinking about the future, that may have started when I was a kid, when my father was an engineer. He couldn't get me interested in engineering, but he got me interested in science fiction. Um, and so I, the, I grew up with the space program. The, I remember getting up early in the morning to watch the Apollo, the, the, Apollo, the Gemini, the Gemini uh, launches. I remember getting up early to watch John Glenn's uh, launch for his orbit. So uh, that's always had me thinking kind of about, about the future. And uh, that kind of, um, I discovered the World Future Society in the late 90s, went to some meetings and discovered the Houston program and never really just, you know, I was focused on my, um, my work, full-time work career at that time. Um, you know, if I had it to do over again, I might've become a full-time professional futurist decades earlier. But uh, so it's something I kind of 
after all these years, maybe found, it, I don't know whether it was what I was meant to have at this stage of life or whether I should have done it all along, but it's been probably been lurking since I was a kid. You were inspired by the space program. What have you felt about get, seeing that almost entirely given up since then? Well, that's interesting because it, it, it's, you know, one of the things that I like to talk about, I, I occasionally do local talks for civic groups and uh, I have a talk uh, uh, on what I call the three deadly sins of bad foresight or how not to think about the future. And the very first one is straight line thinking. And you may, you remember 2001, A Space Odyssey, of course, uh, I, I was about 18 years old when they came out and we thought, oh yeah, in 2000, Pan Am is going to have regular flights to the moon. Pan Am didn't even exist anymore by 2000, of course. And uh, we're going to be going to Jupiter. And even Arthur C. Clarke couldn't see in 1968 that humanity's future at the turn of the century didn't lie in outer space. It lay, lay in cyberspace, interestingly enough. Uh, the thing about that is, is it, 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 it bothered me. But also, as I learn more about what futurists learn about, technology doesn't always move in a straight line. It doesn't necessarily move exponentially. If you look at all of human progress, yes, at least in the last few centuries, it looks exponential. But really, in any given technology, there tends to be an, an S-curve. Uh, or a, um, a punctuated equilibrium, as it's often called as well, whereby there is rapid increase in a technology in times of need, followed by a leveling out in implementation and then time of need. So what happened, if you look back with the space program in the 1960s, it was kind of an artificial need driven by the Cold War. We got way ahead of ourselves because we had to beat the Russians there. Once we did, everybody kind of lost interest. And it's kind of, it hasn't progressed that rapidly. If you look at the technology they used back then, you look at a, the Apollo 13 movie and you see these guys rapidly figuring out how to save these astronauts who've had the explosion on, on, on the spacecraft using slide rules. In, you know, 19, was it 1971, I think, 72, whatever. But um, uh, we've got so much more technology today, but the need all of a sudden is there again. The, the race to, uh, to gain resources in outer space, the commercial space race, and the fact that it's not just the U.S. and the old Soviet Union anymore. You've got five or six uh, na nations in there, plus the commercial uh, race to space. So all of a sudden, it's it's accelerating again because uh, there is a driver, and there needs to, there generally needs to be a driver for technology to move forward. What was the emotion you had when you watched them? Um, boy, it's so long ago. You know, it's it's. And you understand, I was a kid watching it, and I thought, yeah, this is just going to happen. This is going to be, you know, this is going to be our future. And um, I remember watching that first, you know, the, the man on the moon, and it's, um, you know, what we're what exactly uh, something what eleven days away from the fiftieth anniversary of the lunar landing. Um, but you know. Who knows what, when I was, I was 18 years old when Neil Armstrong stepped on, on the moon. Um, I'm trying to remember, I had an elderly aunt that was visiting and watching it on TV, complaining that we were spending resources on that. And um, my attitude always was, this is a, a down payment on the future of mankind. This is not like the Wright brothers making the first airplane flight. This is like the first creature crawling out of the sea onto the land. It's an evolutionary step. So I, I think maybe I, even for 18 years old, I had an intellectual view of it as well. At least that's how I, I justified it to myself. And those were the big problems that the smartest in the society tackled. Today, it's how to make a more effective photo sharing app. Does that disappoint you at all? Yeah, it certainly does. I mean, when I spoke to David Wood uh, of London Futurists on his book, The Abolition of Aging, he, you know, and he talked about the possibility of getting to robust human rejuvenation by 2040, and he had forecast a 50% chance of such. Um, if people are more interested in figuring better ways to get people to click on advertisements on the internet, then we're not going to get there. We need to focus resources on things like longevity, on the positive uses of 
artificial intelligence. You, you mentioned CRISPR, and that's something that, that maybe even has potential advantage for space. I mean, you're looking at, um, at there are people out there advocating, and this is something that I, I thought of when I first learned about CRISPR, is that maybe we can actually uh, edit the human genome to make us uh, more able to tolerate uh, the environment of, say, say, Mars, which still, to my thinking, the greatest impediment to sending humans to Mars and certainly colonizing is, is the environmental issue of the, uh, the low gravity and the radiation, never mind the resources. Uh, our bodies are not made to withstand that level of radiation and that, that low level of gravity indefinitely. Do you think if we feel we have the ability, we should? Or do you, are you more of the opinion the unknown unknowns outnumber the knowns? Well, the unknown outknowns, I think, matter always going <laughs> to out, outnumber the knowns because there's probably infinitely many uh, po possible futures. Uh, there's just it, 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 more than we can, we can fathom, I think. But I, I think that uh, that doesn't mean we shouldn't go ahead. I think it means, you know, I take the kind of the, the, um, the integral approach, you know, with the intelligent deployment of technology. We certainly, uh, I, I'm totally opposed to Luddism, and I've got a, a story uh, in regards to that that I think is, a, is an effective one, but... Uh, go for it. Go for it. Well, so in terms of the opposition to Luddism, and this is something, you know, I was asked at one of the talks that I gave uh, on the, these uh, sins of bad foresight, what I thought was going on in Washington. And I said, look, I don't want to start that. This was a local Rotary Club lunch. And I said, look, I don't want to start a food fight here <laughs> and, or worse over politics, but I don't know a single serious futurist that isn't absolutely mortified by the way Donald Trump is taking the, the US. And of course, in a lot of Europe, you've got the, the populism as well. Um, it's, it's, trying to go back to some kind of imagined idyllic 1950s or, or something to, to bring back coal to, uh, you know, what, what were these glory days? I can tell, and the example that I give, and I think it's a great one, in the beginning of the 15th century, the early part of the 15th century, the preeminent power in the world was China. All right. Europe was still kind of a late medieval backwater. They were kind of on the just on the verge of the Renaissance, but China had already invented gunpowder, already invented the movable type printing press. They had a massive fleet of what they called treasure ships that went all over the world trading. They were kind of the world's first globalists and everybody wanted to court their, their military and economic favor. Uh, they had a very progressive emperor. The emperor died and the conservative factions in his administration rebelled and pulled them inward. So we don't want to do all this. We don't want to interact with the world. We want, maybe it was China first. Well, you know, it's only taken them 600 years to be back on top again. And in fact, they were very, that wound up falling far, far behind the West. And it, it, it's only now, ironically, with uh, you know, a non-democratic government, but one that does look forward, uh, is forward-looking and understands the importance of technology and globalism that they're, that they're getting back on top again. So I think that's, that, that story of the history of China is one that we should look at, not just their last 50 years, but their last 600 years. Is democracy handicapped by its short-term horizons for elections? Unfortunately, I think it is. Now, um, that it doesn't, I don't think it has to be that way, uh, but that's, that's one of the biggest problems we have uh, in, this, in this country, in the West, and particularly I think the U.S. may be worse at it than, say, some of the European countries, but uh, they still have some of that as well, is that politicians want to kick the can down the road. If there's a problem, let the next guy deal with it because I want to get reelected. Let's, you know, let the public have their cake and eat it too now. And that is a problem. That is a problem. Now it, you have the diversity, which is an advantage. You have the, the checks and balances, which are usually an advantage, but um, the short term thinking can be, can be very much a disadvantage in, in, in any organization, not just government.
one of our earlier episodes, we had a climate, uh, not a climate, um, a uh, political scientist on basically they evaluated voting systems. That's what their organization did. And the U.S. had the provably worst democratic system imaginable in terms of any and all democratic systems out there. And it's because of the winner take all dynamic. You basically create an, two opposing forces, which inevitably break. It was, uh, in, it was an interesting perspective, but so true once you look at it. Well, that's, that's a very interesting perspective. And I'll tell you an opposite one that I heard or that I read from one of the people that I admire and follow. And that's the British-Israeli physicist, David Deutsch. Uh, he wrote a book called The Beginning of Infinity. Um, and he, he, there's a lot of his, his philosophy of science in that. But as he got into a, a, a kind of... Um, uh, wayward trek into other uh, other topics later in the in the book. He talked about the European parliamentary systems versus the American parliamentary systems, and the problem he saw, for example, uh, with the German parliamentary system, is that the third largest party had been the kingmaker for the last thirty years. <laughs> it's like nobody ever got the full fifty percent, and they were the the third largest party was always able to be the one that made made the government and actually had disproportionate power. And he said he thought with the U.S. system it was easier to get rid of somebody that wasn't it was a winner take all, but maybe it was easier to get rid of somebody that wasn't any good that you want to get rid of. I don't know if that's that's the case. I think there are major flaws in um, the electoral college system and that was the Connecticut compromise, part of the Connecticut compromise and I live in Connecticut, but this isn't 1787, this is 2019 and the world wasn't as uh, urban as it is now back in uh, the 18th, even most of the 19th, and even the first half of the 20th century. So it's con concentrated heavy amounts of population in small areas and given disproportionate voting uh, power to less populated areas, as simple as that. And it's something that will be almost impossible to change. Actually, the kingmaker problem was almost the problem for the U.S. because you have a winner-take-all dynamic. You have to have two parties. They have to become further apart. Otherwise, they become the same thing and no longer exist. When you have a third type of movement come up, second place is willing to compromise on some morals so they can become first place. So suddenly second and third place become first place and you have two parties again and again. They have to constantly stay separated and constantly get further and further from each other. Nothing really changes dynamically, but you don't have the ability for your votes to be represented or cast to down the, bat, the ballot, so to speak. So if your first place vote doesn't end up having a, having a run than your second or third place vote, like most systems. It's, um, it's a little bit more complicated, but if you guys look up election science, Disruptors FM, you can, you can dive deeper into it. I wanted, to, uh, I wanted to get into the longevity side of things, though. What areas have you most excited based off of your research and the guests you've worked with and why? star in this space who I think you've also had also is Aubrey de Grey and I've um, now been able to uh, meet him in person. I think what really got me most excited recently is I was uh, able to attend a workshop at the XPRIZE Foundation in Culver City, California uh, conducted by Peter Diamandis and uh, Sergey Young who was one of his board members. And Sergey Young is uh, a big venture capitalist in his own uh, right and also has the, the Longevity Venture Fund. And the whole purpose was to brainstorm uh, a potential X prize for longevity. And the notion being there was also that there'd probably be a series of them. But the fact, I think what really excites me is how fast the field is growing. It's gone from fringe just a few years ago to really mainstream. Venture capitalists are putting money into it. Uh, more and more people are getting involved. I went to the Undoing Aging Conference in Berlin that had grown so large in two years, they need a bigger venue next year. And it wasn't just the scientists. It were just people that were interested. There were journalists like me and even, again, venture capitalists looking to invest in companies in the ending aging space. So I think the most exciting thing is that 
right now it's it's going mainstream and it, it which means it really does have a chance to happen but in terms of individual technologies there were so many of them in, in any every different field and i don't understand all the hard details of all the technology uh but some of the things that really were, were of interest to me say in the meeting in, in germany with three days of presentations of some of the top people in the world you're talking harvard stanford uh, Einstein College of Medicine uh, was, for example, uh, a vaccine for Alzheimer's disease, a genetic therapy to reverse arthrosclerosis, um, and of course, the Horvath bioclocks, like the methylation clock, to actually measure uh, aging at the cellular level. And one of the things people have been worried about is if we've got a therapy which we say, well, this is going to slow aging 40% just by taking this compound. We might have to test it for 10 or 20 years in people before we get enough data to get it approved. Well, the, the, uh, the, the Horvath cellular uh, aging clocks, like the methylation clock, uh, there are several of them for different systems, actually enable aging to be measured at the cellular level. So in fact, you could measure in a year or two what might take 10 or 20 years if you were having to look at just the outward signs of aging. So th those are just a few of them there and there are many others. Let me play a devil's advocate perspective. This isn't necessarily what I believe, but this is just to analyze a possibility. So could part of the movement and push towards the longevity and anti-aging space not necessarily be true belief, but be something more akin to selling religion, where it's very, very easy to give someone exactly what they want to hear. So people are willing to pour resources, time, wealth, life, et cetera, into something that is their life everlasting, so to speak. Well, you could say that if it wasn't for the fact that there's a lot of real science out there. I mean, what I saw in Berlin was a lot of real science from top scientists all over the world. And in terms of giving people what they want, one of the biggest impediments to the whole ending aging movement is what Aubrey de Grey likes to call the pro-aging trance. Is there are people out there that just say aging's natural, we shouldn't do anything about it. It just happens we're all gonna gonna die. Well you know, it's not necessarily about living forever in terms, uh, which is, is, isn't practical because planet Earth isn't going to be here for, <laughs> forever, but in terms of living a lot longer, a lot healthier without the suffering and the costs, by the way, because we're sitting on, on really an economic time bomb with, uh, say, the baby boom generation a a aging and getting into the years consuming large amounts of health care. Uh, clearly, there are really good economic uh, reasons for doing this. And I know people are afraid about, of overpopulation, but uh, two of your uh, Canadian colleagues uh, wrote, recently wrote a book called Empty Planet, where they say they think population is going to start to decline after 2050 because of the way birth rates are going down, uh, contrary to what the United Nations says. So eh, we might need people to live longer to maintain the species. So there's that scenario as well. We just don't know for sure what the future is. We sort of have to be prepared for all possibilities. And even if we were just to have the age quality improve. So no one wants to be 100 and feel 100. But if you're 100 and you feel 25, and even if you've only got two years left feeling 25, that's still pretty darn sweet. Yeah, well, what I like to say is I, I am 68, I look 58, I act 38, and I feel 108 the day after I act 38. But, um, you know, I would be happy just to feel the way I do right now for another, you know, you know, I'd like to still be playing. If I'm alive at 90, I'd like to still be playing tennis at 90. I played two sets today in the heat, and I was dragging at the end of it, but I still, you know, keep very active. I think one of the keys is belief. So not if you're alive at 90, but on your 90th birthday, you're going to be playing tennis. Yeah, absolutely. And my, hey, my dad made it to 92. So, you know, and hopefully we're, by the time I'm 92, we're going to have some of these uh, therapies. So maybe I'll make it to 112. I'm certainly hoping because there's a lot more I want to do and a, a lot more that I want to do to help build a better future. Such as? Uh, well, <laughs> You know, I think my, it's my mission and my, my mission 
is to educate people and to be an advocate for advocate for long term thinking. So for me, if I can have just a, a little bit of an impact uh, for the remainder of my days on, on a better future, uh, because a better future starts with how we think about it. And if we've got people thinking further ahead and, and thinking rationally about all the possibilities, then th that's my help. My help is really as a communicator. Uh, so, uh, you know, I am not uh, at this stage of my career about to become um, an entrepreneur again. Um, and I was only in a minor sense an entrepreneur anyway. Uh, and um, I, as I said, my my mission is to kind of interview the doers and the thinkers and get that message out there on what are our challenges, what are our opportunities, what are the dangers, but what are the really good things we could do as well. What are some of the most inspiring innovators that you've interviewed and what they're working on? Uh, let's see, some inspiring interview innovators. Um, a really interesting one for me is I interviewed a guy by the name of Eric D., uh, in 2017, that was my, my first year because I've been doing this about two and a half years now. And Eric has a company called Bloom Life. And he and his partner developed what amounts to a, a fitness tracker for the unborn baby. Right? It, is an, it is actually a, a, a fitness tracker that the, the pregnant woman attaches to her belly you know, once or twice a day and gets monitoring information on the health of the baby and the mother. They actually entered this in an innovation contest at CES, Consumer, you know, Consumer Electronics Show, about four years ago. We're one of three finalists that were selected to go to Necker Island and present to Richard Branson, and they won. <laughs> so very, very interesting. They're hoping eventually to use artificial intelligence to uh, artificial intelligence to be able to forecast more accurately actual labor as opposed to, as opposed to the false alarms and, and maybe uh, also to, uh, to actually uh, see any problems that might be occurring in the health of the mother or the, or the fetus. So it's still in its early stages. I, I haven't followed up with them. Now, um, here's the second one, and this is an interview I did late last year, and it's a part of a three-part series on future driving. And it is, uh, and by the way, the series is up for award for best futures work by the Association of Professional Futurists. And it was with uh, Eric Schmidt. He, the, the, um, he is the CEO of a company called Rapid Flow Technologies. They're located in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. They use advanced sensing devices, edge computing, and artificial intelligence algorithms to control traffic flows. So it's basically intelligent traffic control. Uh, they, never mind self-driving cars, flying cars. I did podcasts on that. This is using current technology to optimize traffic flow in an urban setting to minimize downtime, to increase transit times. They started in Pittsburgh with about 50 intersections and found that they could get about a 30 to 40% improvement uh, in terms of uh, rush hour traffic flow, in terms of less, less standing time, which means less environmental issues as well with the idling vehicles. And they're in the process of expanding. I think he said they're gonna expand that to 200 intersections in Pittsburgh. They're doing it in Atlanta. Uh, a couple of places in New England, uh, some international. So when I last spoke to them late, late last year, they already had maybe six or eight communities that were going ahead to deploy this technology, which I thought was uh, a very innovative use and a way to it really improve. You know, people are looking long-term with the self-driving cars. It's very ambitious, but it's going to take quite a while to have an impact. This is something that's really starting to have an impact now. And that's the, those are the most exciting things is you need transitional technology. I think the, uh, I think the electric scooters are pretty transformational as well in terms of how they can innovate and shift the way that cities are used and gotten around in, so to speak. Yeah, interesting. And by the way, they, they try to, I, I, I think with the rapid flow, I think they do try to look for bicyclists and pedestrians on the road as well. Um, but, but, you know, part of that series was also a talk on just the interconnectivity involved with self-driving cars and how important that's going to be for them to talk 
to to one one another. And by the way, the rapid flow guy was said that's great because when they talk to each other, they'll talk to us as well, and we'll even be able to maximize the uh, optimize the traffic flow even more so, which kind of you know probably uh, uh, really hopefully speaks well for uh, for the a less congested urban urban future. Which is the worst thing ever. No one likes sitting in traffic. So you brought up the three common sins of forecasting. What were the other two? Well, they weren't forecasting, but just foresight, bad thinking about the future. So the original title of the talk was Horse Manure, Three Deadly Sins of Bad Foresight. And Horse Manure uh, actually refers to the great horse manure crisis of 1894. Uh, it's a great story and a great way to start the talk because uh, in turn, and this has to do again with straight line thinking. There was a major international urban conference to, to discuss many of the urban problems of that era. Uh, the biggest one being all the horse manure and all the rapidly growing industrialized urban cities of the world. The industrial revolution was exploding and more and more people and more and more jobs were coming to New York and London and Chicago, Berlin, whatever, and the streets were were inundated with horse manure. I mean, there were ten thousand hansom cabs in London alone, and um, there were predictions. All right, uh, at that time, one of them in the Times of London said that by 1940, every sh- street in London would be 30 feet deep in horse manure. Uh, straight line thinking. There was uh, there was a, a similar one in New York that uh, you know by 1930, all the horse manure would be up to third story windows, uh, at the rate they were growing. Straight line thinking, and of course, the the uh, the that urban conference basically they gave up after three days and said there's no uh, there's no solution for this one. In fact, the solution that had been invented ten years later, right in the transportation space. The internal combustion engine, right? That was, you know, the, the Benz family had invented the, uh, the com- con- internal combustion automobile about 10 years earlier. Now, admittedly, it was expensive. It was unreliable. Uh, it might be the way you might look at self-driving cars now. Uh, maybe expensive and uh, not reliable yet, but it's a, it's a solution for the future. It took Henry Ford in 1908 to kind of solve that. So, um, and then... Um, of course, I, I mentioned the peripheral uh, vision stuff, and the other one is simply looking uh, too short term, uh, and that's uh, that's a big one. I call it uh, foresight myopia, as opposed to foresight blinders, which is looking too broadly, too short term. Uh, we can talk about two companies that uh, we we can look at as opposite versions of that. Of course, Sears. <laughs> What's happened to Sears? And you can say that Amazon killed them, but Walmart killed them. Even before Amazon did Walmart pass them, they were stuck on the next quarter. And if they were forecasting beyond that, it was probably, do we have enough inventory to meet our needs? You know, they didn't really look at how the world was changing beyond next week. And it was to their detriment. But you might, you know, go back to the late 1960s. If I name, I'm going to name a company that was in the forefront of long-term thinking. It's going to surprise you because it wasn't, I'm not talking about Intel or Texas Instruments. Apple didn't exist yet. Google and Facebook and Netflix didn't exist yet. Interestingly enough, it was Shell Oil. Shell Oil. In the late 60s, they had an internal futures group that actually was constructing scenarios of things that might happen uh, in the uh, you know, longer term than just the next year or two. Okay. One of the scenarios that they came up with in 1969, four years before it happened, was a cutoff of Arab oil, <laughs> which happened in 1973 with the first Arab oil embargo. Um, now, they never, I don't think they've ever indicated exactly what they did in, or what contingencies they might have had. And they haven't talked about what scenarios they might have had that didn't happen. But if you look at their market share from the late 60s, they were kind of the, the bottom of the barrel of the big seven. And they've moved up you know, more to the middle of the pack. They've gained market share since that time. Uh, later on in the 1980s, a, a, an iconic futures group called the Global Business Network, headed by Peter Schwartz, who's one of the uh, 
best known futurists on, on the planet, author of a book called the a classic text from the 90s called The Art of the Long View. And he's also uh, on the board of directors of the Long Now Foundation. Global Business Network was doing, was hired as an outside group by Shell to do scenarios for them in the early 80s. One of the scenarios they came up with was the collapse of the Soviet Union. So, and again, they've never told us exactly what contingencies they might have had and which scenarios didn't come into play. But if you look at Shell's relative success in that period of time compared to, say, Sears, it's clear that, that simply having the mindset to be prepared for things like this to happen uh, can, can be a beneficial. So the short-term thinking, so it, it's basically, again, the uh, linear thinking, the, the, the foresight myopia and the foresight blinders, which is the looking too narrow and not seeing what's to the side, be a uh, peripheral visionary, so to speak. How do we avoid having those happen? I see it happen a lot with corporations. We have, we have quarterly returns and we have people optimizing for, of course, getting a better bonus over anything in the long term. We have similar things happening in politics. How do we change that when there is such a short-term incentive that incentivizes the people that are going to be here and the long term doesn't apply because I'm not going to be here anyways. The infrastructure of how our society is built uh, with the short term incentives for both for business and for government business. There's at least some uh, aspect out there of doing better. There are the entrepreneurs out there that are coming up with looking at very long-term businesses. I'm at the World, at the Association of Professional Futurists annual meeting in Seattle a couple of years ago. One of the people I was able to interview, one of the speakers was um, uh, Chris Lewicki of Planetary Resources. They've since been acquired by a bigger company, but their whole raison d'etre uh, was uh, or is to mine the asteroids. <laughs> They're trying to build a, um, a market that may not exist for 20 years. So there are people out there looking long-term. There are certainly entrepreneurs and individuals that do it. Society, much harder. Maybe people like you and I can help by just making people more aware of it, uh, by being advocates for their long-time thinking. But I'd say uh, in business, you're seeing a lot of the bigger corporations looking that way too with with the technology like the self-driving cars for example uh, and how uh, several of the the mainstream automakers see the writing on the wall and are going electric going looking for self-driving and more autonomous um, in terms of politics i don't know if our system supports it the way it's constructed right now unless the electorate starts to demand it and that requires a more more educated populace uh, educated in general and also with some skills about how to look at and think about the future. Which is hard because it's always easier to sell fear than it is to sell hope. Indeed. There's no question about that. And that has to do, uh, for example, with the views of the future uh, that we see uh, coming in popular culture coming out of, out of Hollywood and television and film is that chaos creates tension, which creates entertaining media. I had this discussion uh, just just recently uh, with Joe Tankersley, uh, author of Reimagining Our Tomorrows. Uh, he is uh, he's got an optimistic futurist uh, page on Facebook and a movement. And he's again he he um, he said that perhaps it was in fact I misspeak maybe it was him and not David Wood, who, who mentioned the Alvin Toffler idea of practopias, practically optimistic futures. We, we're not going to have, uh, we're never going to have a utopia, but we don't have to have a dystopia either. I think the, the, the one exception recently uh, was the movie Tomorrowland, which kind of implored uh, humanity to have a more positive view of the future in, in order to create a more positive view, else the, uh, the, the apocalyptic views become self-fulfilling prophecies. Yeah, it's so hard because it is so much more entertaining. It sells so much better. I'm even, I mean, I'm even working on a dystopian sci-fi novel and I can't really help it because I feel like part of sci-fi's role isn't necessarily, it's not to sell itself purely. It's to warn of potential trends we're headed towards. Cybersecurity looks bad. Genetic editing is dangerous. We're going to have some risks with these big things that without having some type of thought like Bostrom's book, Super Intelligence, or like Terminator, 
if we run head forth towards AI, we might not like the consequences when we get there. Yeah, well, and that's interesting. And I've, in terms of that uh, apocalyptic and negative futures, I'm going to call up the most objective view that I've, I've uh, received in all the podcasts I did. And that was with uh, Jerome Glenn. Uh, he is the executive director and uh, founder of the Millennium Project and the lead author on their State of the Future report, which comes out almost every, they've issued like 19 of them in 21 years. And there are 18 different realms of human endeavors that they look at from environment to technology to government to health, food, crime, uh, and on and on. And he said, you know, if you look at it, we're doing a lot better than people realize in a lot of them. When they first started doing this, um, you know, 20 plus years ago, nearly something like 40% of the world was in extreme poverty, and it's only about 10% now. And um, uh, education, the literacy is, is way up. Uh, life expectancies, despite the, the recent slight blips in the U.S. and some Western co countries the last couple of years, which are probably lifestyle uh, related uh, life expectancies are up. Yeah, there are a lot of challenges and there are bad things, the environment, uh, the p potential for cybercrime, uh, et cetera, but he st their state of the future index is still positive. We're still actually as a whole doing better, but there's a tendency, and particularly for the news media more than anything else to focus on the negative because you know, it's clickbait. Yeah, if we could have a 100-year newspaper, everything would be freaking incredible with the occasional World War I, World War II. Unfortunately, that's not how the 24-hour news cycle is designed. So there's always going to be more small negatives than there are small or big positives. Yeah, absolutely the case. I've said time and time again that, I, you know, to some respect, uh, the, the 24-hour news channels aren't so much news as they are uh, essentially current events theater. And to do that, they have to sensationalize every time you turn any one of them on. And it doesn't matter whether you're talking left, right, or center, MSNBC, CNN, Fox, uh, there's always breaking news. And half the time, it's really something pretty innocuous, but they got to make something out of it because they, you've got 200 channels to surf and they've got to grab your attention. And, you know, the fact that something's a little bit better today doesn't seem to grab people's attention. Bleeds it leads. That's what we're evolved to look for. I want to jump into the patron only bonus section now. You ready? And for uh, listen yeah. yeah. And for listeners, if you support us at a level of five dollars or more per month on disruptors.fm slash Patreon, which helps us make the show sustainable going forward, then you guys will get access to the next three or four bonus questions, some of the some of the more fun ones, and then we'll jump back to the episode. Okay. One last question, pivoting off of that, is if you were to focus on one thing that I haven't asked you about, what should I have asked you about and why? Oh boy. You should have warned me you were going to ask, <laughs> ask that because um, there's so much out there. I think one really interesting thing, and I think mostly positive, very disruptive thing that we haven't talked about, uh, and I have not yet been able to get anybody on my podcast on the future of food, but there are some you know, phenomenal possibilities out there in areas like the laboratory-grown meat. Now, that's... Uh, clearly a uh, uh it's interesting because i have been to uh, networking meetings where i've met people who said oh you're a futurist and i mentioned the, the laboratory grown meat and they go yuck but they have pictures of vats of chemicals or something and it's it's artificial they don't realize that it's real animal protein that is effectively being cultured um and the point for this is one growing global population you know, some people say, oh, we're going to have to be eating insects because we can't provide enough meat. Uh, also, those of us in the West <laughs> are not too thrilled with that prospect. But, um, uh, you know, the, the Chinese, in fact, have invested a substantial amount of money, I think, in an Israeli company that's in 
that, that's in that space. And of course, you've got Memphis Meats here in the U.S. and along with others uh, that uh, is getting uh, investment from some of the big um, bigwigs in Silicon Valley, for example. But the other issue is, of course, is probably the greatest single contributor to climate change is animal agriculture. Uh, it's a big use of energy. It's a big use of water and resources. So never mind the animal suffering with growing animals in difficult conditions, uh, maybe, maybe inhumane conditions, and then killing them. Uh, you've got the opportunity to cut back on the, on the resource use and the greenhouse gases, which are tremendous. Um, just the methane that uh, all the cattle create, so to speak. So uh, that's something that uh, isn't mentioned as much as a potentially disruptive technology. Clearly, there's already the Luddite faction among the the uh, the, the, the poultry and cattle growers who are trying to uh, place restrictions on it and not allow it to be called meat and uh, the like because they're protecting their domains. But uh, in the long run, if it happens, the potential benefits to society are absolutely huge. And it's not something that I see has major downsides other than the fact that it's going to disrupt jobs in some, some, some industries. Yeah, if we get clean meat to be on par with regular meat, you'd have to be a horrible person to want an animal to be killed for your meal in terms of opting for that over a similarly priced uh, alternative. I want to I wanna get ready to wrap things up now. And that's one last question. If you had to leave people with one thing, quote, call to action, it can be anything, what would it be and why? Well, I think it's, it's just start thinking longer term. You know, if you normally only think to next month, it, even in your own future, to next month's paycheck, think six months ahead. However long you normally think ahead, think longer. That, that's it. And, and look for opportunities to impress that view on society as well. So, uh, I, you know, and obviously I also encourage them to not only to listen to your podcast, but to, to listen to mine and some of the thinkers in that space that I've been able to talk to. And of course, we'll have links and everything in the show notes, guys, disruptors.fm. Definitely recommend checking it out. Mark has some incredible guests on the program. Seeking for- Delphi. <laughs> Seeking Delphi. We will, of course, point you guys there. Check it out. Listen to it. Enjoy. Subscribe. Thanks for tuning in, guys. Hope you've enjoyed this. Thanks for coming on, Mark. Thanks. Uh, very much a pleasure, Matt. And we will talk to you guys again soon. Until next time, go make it happen. Cheers. <laughs>